you know, the world's climate scientists tell us that the highest safe level of emissions would be around 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We're already at 400. They tell us that the sort of safest we could hope to do without having perilous implications as far as drought, famine, human conflict, major species extinction would be about a two degrees Celsius increase in temperature. Uh, we're rapidly approaching that and with all the built in carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere, we're easily going to exceed that. So on our watch, we are facing the next major extinction of species on the earth that we haven't seen since the time of the dinosaurs disappearing. You know, when whole countries go underwater because of sea level rise, when whole countries find that there's so much drought that they can't feed their population, and as a result, they need to desperately migrate to another country or invade another country. I mean, we're going to have climate wars in the future. And what about, what about livestock and animal agriculture? Uh, well, what about it? I mean... My name's Kip. This is me. I had a cliche U.S. American childhood. My mom was a teacher, my dad was in the military, and I have one sister. I played all the sports growing up, but I always loved the outdoors and camping. Life was simple, not a care in the world. And then this guy showed up. Like so many of us, I saw his film An Inconvenient Truth about the impacts of global warming, and it scared the emojis out of me. In Al Gore's film, he describes how our Earth is in peril. Climate change stands to affect all life on this planet. From monster storms, raging wildfires, record droughts, ice caps melting, acidification of the oceans to entire countries going underwater. That could all be caused by humans' demands on the Earth. With scientists warning unless we take drastic measures to correct our environmental footprint, our time on this planet may be limited to only 50 more years. I wanted to do everything I could to help. I made up my mind right then and there to change how I lived and to do whatever I possibly could to find a way for all of us to live together in balance with the planet sustainably forever. I started to do all the things Al told us to do. I became an OCE, obsessive compulsive environmentalist. I separated the trash and recycling. I composted, changed all the light bulbs, took short showers, turned the water off when I brushed my teeth, turned off lights when leaving a room and rode my bike instead of driving everywhere. But as the years went by, it seemed as if things were getting worse. I had to wonder, with all the continuing ecological crisis facing the planet, even if every single one of us adopted these conservation habits, was this really gonna be enough to save the world? It just seemed that there was something more to the story. I thought I was doing everything I could to help the planet. But then, with one friend's post, everything changed. The Post sent me to a report online published by the United Nations stating that cows produce more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector. This means that raising cattle produces more greenhouse gases than all cars, trucks, trains, boats, planes combined. 13% compared to 18% for livestock. This is because cows produce a substantial amount of methane from their digestive process. Methane gas from livestock is 25 to 100 times more destructive than carbon dioxide from vehicles. Here I'd been riding my bike everywhere to help reduce emissions, but it turns out there's more to climate change than just fossil fuels. I started doing more research. The UN, along with other agencies, reported that not only did livestock play a major role in global warming, it is also the leading cause of resource consumption and environmental degradation destroying the planet today. How is it possible I wasn't aware of this? I thought this information would be plastered everywhere in the environmental community. I went to the nation's largest environmental organization's websites, 350.org, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, Climate Reality, Rainforest Action Network, Amazon Watch, and was shocked to see they had virtually nothing on animal agriculture. What was going on? Why would they not have this information on there? 
It seemed the main focus for many of these groups was natural gas and oil production, with fracking being the latest hot issue due to water usage and contamination. Hydraulic fracturing for natural gas uses an incredible amount of water. A staggering 100 billion gallons of water is used every year in the United States. But when I compare this with animal agriculture, raising livestock just in the U.S. consumes 34 trillion gallons of water. And it turns out the methane emissions from both industries are nearly equal. Living in California, a state plagued by drought and water shortages, water use is a major concern for many of us. The average Californian uses about 1,500 gallons per person per day. Um, about half of that is related to the consumption of meat and dairy products. So meat and dairy products are incredibly water intensive, um, in part because the animals are using very water intensive grains. That's what they, they eat. Um, and so all of the water embedded in, in the grain and that the animal eats essentially is, is considered part of the virtual water footprint of that product. I found out that one quarter pound hamburger requires over 660 gallons of water to produce. Here I've been taking these short showers trying to save water and to find out just eating one hamburger is the equivalent of showering two entire months. So much attention is given to lowering our home water use, yet domestic water use is only 5% of what is consumed in the U.S. versus 55% for animal agriculture. That's because it takes upwards of 2,500 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. I went on the government's Department of Water Resources Save Our Water campaign, where it outlines behavior changes to help conserve our water, like using low flow shower heads, efficient toilets, water saving appliances, and fixed leaky faucets and sprinkler heads, but nothing about animal agriculture. When I added up all the government's recommendations, I was saving 47 gallons a day, but still, that's not even close to the 660 gallons of water for just one burger. I wanted to see if I could somehow talk with the government about this. Just calling to see if uh, we could schedule an interview. Yeah, uh, that would be good. What What does your schedule look like uh, this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon? Um, tomorrow afternoon could be good. Uh, for the urban environment, there are a lot of things that can be done. Indoor, uh, you know, uh, using uh, low flow shower heads, uh, low flow faucets, um, uh, efficient uh, toilets, uh, efficient um, um, apply water using appliances. All those are really good areas that can help quite a lot. But the biggest water savings is from outdoors. We have to be mindful of the way we use water. We have to use it as efficiently as possible. We have to protect its quality and we have to be good stewards of the environment that depend on water. Uh, and checking the sprinklers. A lot of time we get a lot of leaks and broken sprinklers and uh, things like that that wastes water. Uh, and those are the areas that there's a lot of room for conservation. Kept, it kept on coming up a lot was of animal agriculture. So can you comment on that at all about how much that plays a role in water consumption and pollution? That's, uh, I mean, that's not my area. One study that I found that one pound of beef, 2,500 gallons of water. Yeah, yeah. Um, eggs is 477 gallons of water, and cheese almost 900 gallons. I mean, I guess it's one simple, why isn't it on save our water? Just, it's kind of like if you went to someone's house and my neighbor has a faucet, you know, dripping, dripping, and then you see it, this giant hose turn full blast mm -hmm. until 660 gallons of water are shooting out into the street, flooding the entire street. I think I would say, hey, you know, turn that off, please. It seems like it's a huge mm -hmm. thing that we could be doing by far more than anything else. Uh, Just like if that, if that is really the case. I think that the water footprint of animal husbandry is greater than other activities. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That would be really powerful, just rather than waiting till we're in a drought, you know, what do you think about just starting now and do whoever's in charge of the Save Our Water, hey, let's start having, encouraging people to eat less meat now because these, these studies are coming out. I don't think that'll happen. Why? 
I don't think that'll happen. Why? Because of the way government is set up here. That's interesting, though. What? Why, though? One is water management, and the other one is behavior change. Behavior of taking showers and not not watering your lawn and doing all that—that's behavior. Wow. Clearly, the government did not want to talk about this issue. Their inability to answer, along with the environmental organization's silence on the topic of animal agriculture, made it seem something more was going on. I started doing more investigating on the impacts of livestock and found out the situation was actually worse than I had thought. In 2009, two advisors from the World Bank released an analysis on human-induced greenhouse gases, finding that animal agriculture was responsible not for 18%, as the UN stated, but was actually 51% of all greenhouse gases, 51%. Yet all we hear about is burning fossil fuels. This devastating figure is due to clear-cutting rainforest for grazing, respiration, and all the waste animals produced. This makes animal agriculture the number one contributor to human-caused climate change. But not only that, I found out raising animals for food consumes a third of all the planet's fresh water, occupies up to 45% of the Earth's land, is responsible for up to 91% of Amazon destruction, is a leading cause of species extinction, ocean dead zones, and habitat destruction. Yet, the world's largest environmental groups that are supposed to be saving our world didn't mention this anywhere. I had to speak with environmental organizations to find out why they weren't addressing this issue. I sent off dozens of emails, made call after call, spent hours on hold. Days became weeks and weeks became months, and for some reason, no one wanted to talk to me about this. So bizarre. I supported these organizations for so long and now was met with silence. I was, however, able to connect with a handful of environmental authors and advocates that were willing to address this issue. I took my old trusty van, Super Blue, out of retirement and hit the road. So my calculations are that without using any gas or oil or fuel ever again from this day forward, that we would still exceed our maximum carbon equivalent greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the 565 gigatons, by the year 2030 without the electricity sector even, or energy sector even factoring in the equation, all simply by eating, raising and eating livestock. If you reduce the amount of methane emissions, the level in the atmosphere go down, goes down fairly quickly and within decades, as opposed to CO2, if you reduce the emissions to the atmosphere, you don't really see a signal in the atmosphere for a hundred years or so. The single largest contributor to um, every known environmental ill known to humankind deforestation, land use, water scarcity, the destabilization of communities, world hunger, the list doesn't stop. It's an environmental disaster that's being ignored by the very people who should be championing. Free living animals made up, you know, 10,000 years ago, made up 99% of the biomass. And human beings, we only made up 1% of the biomass. Today, only 10,000 years later, which is really just a fraction of time, we human beings, and the animals that we own as property make up 98% of the biomass. And wild, free-living animals make up only 2%. We've basically completely stolen the world, the earth, from free-living animals to use for ourselves and our cows and pigs and chickens and factory farm fish. And the oceans have been even more <laughs> devastated. Concerned researchers of the loss of species uh, agree that the primary cause of loss of species on our earth that we're witnessing is due to overgrazing and habitat loss from livestock production on land and by overfishing, which I call fishing, in our oceans. And we're in the middle of the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years. The rainforest is being cut down at the rate of an acre per second. And the driving force behind all of this is animal agriculture, cutting down the forest to graze animals and to grow soybeans. Uh, genetically engineered soybeans to feed to the cows and pigs and chickens and factory farmed fish. 91% of the loss of rainforest in the Amazon area thus far to date, 91% that's been destroyed is due to raising livestock. The leading cause of environmental destruction is, is animal agriculture. 
I just couldn't understand why the world's largest environmental organizations were not addressing this when their entire mission is to help protect the environment. But that's the thing too, as they say, you know, you use less coal, ride your bike, you know, eat less meat. Yeah. I think they think it's, I think they focus grouped it and it's a political loser. In terms of, yeah, because they're, they're membership organizations, you know, a lot of them. They're looking to maximize the number of people making contributions. And if they get identified as being anti-meat or challenging people on their everyday habits, that's something that's so dear to people that uh, it will hurt with their fundraising. They do not want to address the primary driving cause of environmental devastation, which is animal agriculture, because they're businesses and they want to make sure that they have a reliable source of funding. I had a, I went to invited to a meeting with Al Gore some years ago now and made these methane arguments. He was really pushed back. And that's just his argument. It's hard enough to get people to think about CO2. Don't confuse them. I think that the problem with a lot of organizations that are focused and that have a laser focus uh, don't go off message because they don't want to piss off another whole group of people that will make their lives difficult. If you listen to the majority of the, of the major environmental organizations, they're not telling you to do much besides live your life the way you've been living it, but change your light bulb from time to time, drive less, use less plastic, recycle more. It's better for their fundraising and better for their profile to create a victim and perpetrator sort of plot line. You know, it's like when we talk about um, the fact that when we have a dysfunctional family and the father is an alcoholic, that's the one thing no one talks about. You know, everybody goes around that, and yet it's the one thing that's causing the devastation in the, in the relationships in the family, because no one wants to talk about it. How could these organizations not know? I mean, the, the issue is right in front of them. It's unmistakable at this point. And just like these organizations, they're, they're, they're falling over themselves to show the general public that Climate change is human cause, and in doing so, they completely fail to uh, to see what's right in front of them. That, that that animal agriculture, raising and killing animals for food, is really what's killing the planet. That was it. No more emails. No more phone calls. I had enough. I realized if I wanted answers, I would have to go to these organizations' headquarters in person. Hi, how's it going? We're we're uh, we're doing a Dr. Fully feature documentary and it's on sustainability and you know, animal agriculture plays a role and yeah. we're seeing if we could talk to David Barr. Barr? Barr? Yeah. Okay. Did you have an appointment with him? Uh, we've been trying for like it's almost two months and we haven't even had one one uh, receptive email sure. or anything so we're seeing if we can uh, set something up. Let me, so they sent out their PR person instead. She refused to be filmed and told us to turn off the camera, but promised someone from their rainforest, ocean, and climate change departments would all speak with us, finally. Next stop was to give Sierra Club a visit. Turns out they were a bit more receptive to me showing up at their doorstep. Hey, how's it going? With uh, the climate change, what's the leading cause of that? Well, it's basically burning too many fossil fuels. Uh, you know, so coal, natural gas, oil, tar sands, oil shale, all these new exotic fuels that are kind of hybrids between them. Uh, but that's basically what is loading up the atmosphere. So we have this greenhouse effect where the heat is getting trapped and the temperatures are soaring um, at a rate that has never existed in the history of the earth. And what about, what about livestock and animal agriculture? Uh, well, what about it? I mean, uh, we do, you wanna... we'll do it just research. We, a couple of the UN report says it's more livestock accounts for more than all transportation put together. A recent 2009 World Watch report Livestock causes 51% of all greenhouse emission, gas emissions. Yeah, well, um, it is a big issue and we uh, need to address that as well. But, you know, there's just so many different potential sources of <coughs> methane and carbon emissions. If the number one leading cause is animal agriculture and meat consumption, then does not that need to be the number one focus, if not the number two? Well, 
That's your assessment. Our assessment is different. <laughs> well, that was bizarre. So Greenpeace got back to me today and said, it was great to meet with you yesterday. I've spoken with various people here at Greenpeace about your request, but I'm afraid we're not going to be able to help this time. Thanks again, and we wish you the best of luck. Greenpeace's response reminded me of the statistic that 116,000 pounds of farm animal excrement is produced every second in the United States alone. That is enough waste per year to cover every square foot of San Francisco, New York City, Tokyo, Paris, New Delhi, Berlin, Hong Kong, London, Rio de Janeiro, Delaware, Bali, Costa Rica, and Denmark combined. Livestock operations on land has caused more than five, or created more than 500 nitrogen flooded dead zones around the world in our oceans, comprise more than 95,000 square miles of areas completely devoid of life. So any meaningful discussion about the state of our oceans has to always begin by frank discussions about land-based animal agriculture, which is not what our conservation groups Oceania being the largest one in the world right now, uh, the most influential, as well as others. That's not what is at the apex of their discussions. I went on my favorite ocean protection organization's website, Surfrider Foundation, to see what they were doing about this. Mostly what I've found were campaigns about plastic bags and trash, but nothing about animal agriculture. What is the number one coastal water quality issue polluter? Like, yeah, I mean, a lot of it, there's a, it's actually, I call it, we call it the, like the toxic cocktail because it really is this sort of diffuse source. So it's, um, you know, heavy metal from tires and brakes and cars, heavy metals. Um, it is these herbicides and pesticides. So it's really just, it's kind of picking up the, the, everything we leave on the ground and collecting it together and pushing it out into the ocean. So it's hard to actually target like one thing. When we're doing our research on this particular one and runoff, uh, and just kind of increasingly as we're like interviewing more and more people, it keeps coming up uh, the animal agriculture as being, and we read animal agriculture as being the number one water polluter considerably by more than any other. Yeah, that's interesting. I think, you know, I guess it depends on the regions that you focus on, like the urban areas, which is sort of like where we are here in Southern California. We don't see that because there's not a lot of sort of um, agricultural farms. But if you look in the mid Atlantic, sort of Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, that region, I know there's a lot of poultry farms and a lot of hog farms and it's a huge waste issue. I was surprised that not only did they not focus on farm runoff, but they also didn't mention any campaigns about how our oceans are in near collapse. The UN reported that three quarters of the world's fisheries are overexploited, fully exploited, or significantly depleted due to overfishing. The oceans are under siege like never before, and uh, marine environments are in trouble. And if we don't wake up and do something about it, um, we're going to see fishless oceans by the year 2048. That's the prediction from scientists. The fact that when people look at fishing sometimes they're only looking at the fact of the animals who are actually consumed by humans and we're not necessarily looking at all the animals who are caught in the drift nets all the other animals who are killed um, in the industry and when you look at even the shrimping industry has done a lot to devastate the planet as well in terms of breaking down natural barriers that we have to protect the islands we're at over 28 billion animals were pulled out of the ocean last year they're not ever given a chance to recover. They can't recover. They don't multiply that quickly. They don't, you know, they don't come back. We're not giving them an opportunity. The oceans are in complete collapse. The, the, the large fish species are nearing extinction. The way fishing is done today to feed the demand for 90 million tons of fish is primarily through massive fish nets. For every single pound of fish caught, there's up to five pounds of untargeted species trapped, such as dolphins, whales, sea turtles, and sharks, known as bikill. If we were to imagine this same sort of practice happening on the African savanna, targeting gazelle, but in the process scooping up every single lion, giraffe, ostrich, and elephant, nobody would stand for it. Yet, this is what is happening in our oceans every single day. Between 40 and 50 million sharks each year are killed in fishing lines and fishing nets as bykill. 
then their fins might be cut off or not cut off, but they're caught in initially as bykill. And it's from fishing. It's from fishing in, sustainable, in a sustainable manner, in many cases, for fish that are labeled sustainable by, for instance, Oceana and these sustainable certified organizations. So my thought is, is that why would we want to stop at banning shark fin soup if you're concerned about sharks? which all these organizations are, and most of the public at large is now. If we really are concerned about sharks, we would ban fishing. I went on the world's largest ocean conservation group's website, Oceana, to see what they were doing about this. On their site, along with the TED Talk by CEO Andy Sharpless, I was astounded to read, they actually recommend that one of the best ways to help fish is to eat fish. With a world's fish population in near collapse, this seems like saying the best way to help endangered pandas is to eat pandas. I couldn't understand how Oceana could say we could remove close to 100 million tons of fish per year, and that could somehow be sustainable and good for our oceans. Many of the species that are nearing extinction have done so, are uh, being ravaged and becoming nearly extinct in a declining fashion and haven't recovered on the watch of Oceana and on the watch of uh, Marine Stewardship Council and very much on the watch of Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, which you know, I mentioned in one of my lectures, that's you know, their aptly named because that's, that's what they're doing. They're sort of watching this happen instead of you know, aggressively halting it. I mean, according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, you know, roughly three quarters of all the fisheries out there are either fully exploited or overexploited. So there's really not a whole lot of, of, of fish stocks out there that uh, you might consider uh, at healthy levels for the, for the ecosystem. Watching Andy's TED Talk um, gave a, about feeding the world. In 1988, fish catch, as you mentioned, peaked at 85 million tons. How is it possible that we can sustainably catch 100 million tons by 2050, regardless if it's regardless if it's in a farm or if it's in the ocean? If for every pound of fish you're taking out, you're essentially taking out five pounds of wild fish, no matter whether it's a pond or it's or or it's in in the ocean. How can that be sustainable? The ultimate, the ultimate question, right, is, is that there is a tremendous amount of natural production that, that is, you know, basically coming out of the oceans all the time. So we have major, a massive amount of upwelling from our ocean conveyor belt that's bringing up, you know, ancient thousand year old nutrients and, and our ecosystems are turning that into fish. Yes, they're eating each other and you're losing you know, some of that production every step up in the food chain, but you get more every year. You can fish and take some out, and next year there will be more. And if we do that right without ultimately hitting the fundamental driver, it's sort of like living off the, the interest, right? As long as, you don't, as long as you don't bring your principle down, right, if you're investing in something, as long as you're not hitting into that principle and your principle remains high, you could potentially live off the interest forever. Well, and that's the basic idea with fish. With our population right now, what we're doing is 70, if it's 75% depleted, the fishery is now depleted. And you, you know, it's a good analogy with money. We're not living off our interest. We're in extreme debt. And if we're, our population who's trying to live as a family on the same amount of money, and it's increasing 35% to 9 billion people, right. isn't it just, hey, we gotta stop spending money. Yeah. We need to stop eating fish. Well, if, if you could bring the principal back. Fishing of any type is, is depleting not only the species, but you get into this serial depletion where one fish species will be minimized and the fishing industry uh, for that fishery will move on to the next species. And it's, it's called serial depletion, it's aptly named. And in the process, so the fish are being lost, not only, not only the species is being lost, but the next in line is being lost. And then the mechanism is still extremely destructive. So they're losing the fish species, but it needs to be kept in mind, they're also destroying habitat. I think they came up with this term, sustainable fishing, to make ourselves feel good about eating fish and continuing to take fish out of the oceans, when in fact, really, it's Sea Shepherd's position that there is no such thing as sustainable fishing. Seafood is not a protein source for 
uh, a sustainable protein source for the, for the uh, feeding of the planet, of the people on the planet. It's just not. People don't want to hear it because that makes them feel like they have to take action. They have to stop doing something and a lot of people don't want to and people don't want to they they don't want to put it out there because it's uncomfortable they don't want to propose to tell people what to do but we're at a point where we all have to be cognizant and we have to realize and we have to take an action our founder captain watson likes to say if the oceans die we die that's not a tagline that's the truth perhaps the only other ecosystem that is being destroyed at such a rapid rate are the world's rainforests our global rainforests are essentially the planet's lungs. They breathe in CO2 and exhale oxygen. An acre of rainforest is cleared every second. And the leading cause is to graze animals and grow their feed crops. That is essentially an entire football field cleared every single second. And it is estimated that every day, close to 100 plant, animal, and insect species are lost due to rainforest destruction. What is the leading cause, absolute leading cause of rainforest destruction? Human intervention into rainforests is the leading cause. And so it's either for logging or it's for agribusiness. And that's when you're looking at the top global drivers, it will vary a bit by the rainforest that you're talking about. But the way that we're choosing to use these natural resources on a large industrial scale is the leading driver. When I went on Rainforest Action Network's website, I couldn't believe I didn't see anything about cattle. But I did see they had a large campaign against palm oil. Palm oil plantations are causing tremendous deforestation in Indonesian rainforest. It is estimated that palm oil is responsible for 26 million acres being cleared. Though, compared to livestock and their feed crops, they were responsible for 136 million acres of rainforest lost to date. But on their website, I was shocked to find cattle was not included as one of their four main key issues. Instead, they focused on palm, pulp and paper, coal, and tar sands. How could they not have the leading cause of rainforest destruction? I had to wonder, why focus on fossil fuels and not cattle? Is it more fossil fuels or is it more animal agriculture? I don't know why we would ever do a one or the other. I'm just wondering, what, what more is it? I don't necessarily know what it is. Could the executive director of one of the world's largest rainforest protection groups honestly not know what was going on? Or even worse, were they hiding it on purpose? And if so, why? I immediately went to Amazon Watch to see if they would say what the leading cause of rainforest destruction truly is. The most biologically and culturally diverse place on the planet is under massive attack right now. The Amazon rainforest itself could be could be gone in the matter of the next 10 years. What, what is the leading cause of rainforest destruction? The leading cause of rainforest destruction, um, I would say, well, just to put it into the context of what Amazon Watch works on, um, you know, there's, there's many, many drivers of deforestation, as we call them many different reasons and ways that the um, rainforests are destroyed. The main, the ones that cause the most damage and are mo the most widespread are mega projects, such as oil and gas pipelines, such as mining projects, such as mega dam projects. We're not talking about... I felt like I was going in circles with all these groups, as if I were stuck in some strange cowspiracy twilight zone where no one could talk about cows. I couldn't believe these organizations just wouldn't say what the leading cause of rainforest destruction truly is. I had to ask one more time. It's hard to say what is a leading cause of deforestation of the Amazon because they're all destructive, oil and gas, mining, dams, agriculture. But in terms of land use, in terms of the amount of land that um, is destroyed by um, the, when we talk about, in comparison, all those different causes of deforestation, what is, what is causing the most trees to fall, for example? Um, I think it would definitely be agriculture. Unfortunately, one of the biggest causes of deforestation 
um, definitely in the Brazilian Amazon is agribusiness, cattle, cattle grazing and soy production in particular. This is really what's going on. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's like no one, no Greenpeace or no one's mm -hmm. really saying that whole, the whole story? The whole story about the one of the, the, the main cause of deforestation. Yeah. And I think you've brought up some really good points about why isn't, why isn't anybody doing anything about this? Um, and I think in Brazil in particular, I think when we look at, you know, what happened after the forest code was passed um, and people, people who were standing up against the, the, the lobbyists and the interests, the special interests, the cattle industry, the agribusiness industry, what was happening to them? A lot of people who were speaking out got killed. And if you look at, you know, say Carlos, you look at Claudio, there's, a, there's people who People who are putting themselves out there and saying, you know, cattle ranching, you know, is destroying the Amazon. You know, a lot of those people were really putting themselves out there. I mean, look at Dorothy Stang, you know, the nun who lived out in Pará, who was killed. A lot of people will speak up. A lot of people just keep their mouths shut because they don't want to, they don't want to be the next one with the bullet to their head. Sister Dorothy Stang was a U.S.-born nun living in the heart of the Brazilian rainforest. Her life's work was to protect the Amazon. She spoke out openly against the destruction of rainforest from cattle ranching for years. Walking home one night, she was brutally gunned down at point-blank range by a hired gun from the cattle industry. After Greenpeace's initial denial for an interview, I wrote again, begging they reconsider. Greenpeace got back again and said again, I'm afraid we've explored the options here in terms of helping you and are not going to be able to be involved this time. You mentioned you were also speaking to Oceana. I'm sure they'll be able to give you some great quotes about ocean related issues. Thanks again for thinking of us. Unbelievable. With Greenpeace unwilling to be interviewed, I had to find a different avenue for answers. There's something really fishy going on over there. Fortunately, I found a former Greenpeace board of director who now speaks openly about the industry. Environmental organizations, like other organizations, are not telling you the truth about what the world needs from us as a species. It's so frustrating when the information is right before their eyes. It's documented in peer-reviewed papers and journals. It's there for everybody to see, but the environmental organizations are refusing to act. Nowhere do you find in their policies and nowhere do you find in the Greenpeace mission that diet is important, that animal agriculture is the problem. They are refusing like other environmental organizations to, to look at the issue. The environmental community is failing us and they're failing ecosystems. And uh, it's so frustrating to see them do this. NRDC, the Earth's best defense. All right, so here they actually do have a few things on animal agriculture. The leading cause of environmental degradation is um, too much pollution and too much, too many, too many engines churning too fast uh, in too many places around the globe. Lately, in 2009, World Watch reported that livestock causes 51 percent of greenhouse gas emissions, and transportation is around 13. And then the low end, the UN was around 18 to 30, which is more than all transportation all put together. National, internationally. Or nationally, yeah. I, I think energy production and um, transportation are still major sources. So I think um, I don't. I guess I'm not going to comment on that because I'm not familiar with those numbers. So it's <laughs> don't don't quote me on this, but that's cow farts. That's what I think. What that is, uh... <laughs> I think that's cow farts. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Well, that's part of the story. <laughs> Methane production from cows and other livestock flatulence is a major contributor, but mostly it is due to deforestation and the waste they produce, which is 130 times more waste than the entire human population, virtually all without the benefit of any waste treatment. NRDC absolutely, as I said, has a, um, a big food program. In fact, we just, uh, every year we do the Growing Green Awards, and uh, we recognize food innovators. And this last year, uh, one of the uh, awardees was a, a sustainable pork producer, actually, that um, doesn't use any uh, antibiotics. And, um, and also the, the antibiotic use that um, industrial food production in the United States is uses right now is you know we're getting the majority of uh, antibiotics in the United States are um, administered to healthy livestock. I wanted to visit one of these sustainable farms. I found the Markegard grass-fed beef farm on the lush, misty California coast. I met Eric and Donega Markegaard and their four children. Lee and Larry are usually up at six and out, milking the cows, slopping the hogs. Altogether, we graze about 4,500 acres. And uh, this is our home ranch. And this is uh, 952 acres of that. On average, it's about one cow or a cow and a calf per every 10 acres. We would produce annually roughly 80,000 pounds of finished plate-ready meat. We keep about 10 pigs in a roughly a 50-acre area, and we move them around in 10-acre pastures. Some people think that pigs are dirty and gross, but I kind of, I really like them. They have, they know people, and they'll be friends and really nice. And they could be like your best friend, or they could be like a sister, see? They know you when you get to know them. I mean, I shouldn't be bonding, but you have to have a nice steak. Why shouldn't you bond with them? Well, because they're going to turn into bacon. Oh. But These pigs are um, uh, about seven months old now. That's it? Wow. So um, these bigger ones are getting ready to be killed. Those two smaller ones there, you know, they could grow up a few, few more months. I, I love, I love animals and I, that's, that's why I'm in the meat business. It's, it's what